Hi guys, let's do a lecture on photosynthesis. Now, this, I'm going to repeat myself over and over and over again in this lecture uh, just to try to get across the main points I want to get across. I'm going to try to keep it as simple as I can, but photosynthesis is a complicated process. It is an intensive um, metabolic concept. So let's just get in and see where it takes us and sort of go from there. All right, <clears throat> photosynthesis is a process that captures solar energy, transforms that solar energy into chemical energy, and that energy ends up being stored as a carbohydrate molecule. So the idea behind photosynthesis, the real goal, what we're trying to do, is we're trying to take sunlight and end up with a carbohydrate, a sugar molecule of some form. Not necessarily glucose. You hear glucose thrown around a lot. Uh, but a general carbohydrate from which other things can be made. Now, all life on Earth is certainly dependent upon solar radiation at the end of the day. So, uh, if you are waking up in the morning, and you're getting breakfast, and you're getting sausage and eggs, let me tell you that sausage is a pork product, and those uh, pigs were probably eating corn at some stage in their life in order to grow larger. That is a plant. In other words, that sausage is dependent upon solar radiation. Um, the, the eggs are from a chicken. That chicken is without question eating little critters on the ground and or corn products which are plant derived in the long run and that would mean that all the food that you consume is eventually derived from the sun. Now, uh, photosynthetic organisms are not just flowering plants like we think of here, but there are also algal uh, organisms which are capable of photosynthesis and also what are called cyanobacteria which are capable of, of uh, photosynthesis. In fact these are very important to the early development of the planet. The concept is that our planet was initially mostly a carbon dioxide atmosphere and that early cyanobacteria sort of what we call terraformed the planet to give uh, the capacity for other forms of life. In other words releasing lots and lots of oxygen that eventually began dominating the atmosphere and allowing us to survive. So yeah, man. plants in essence, photosynthetic organisms, are very, very important to our daily lives. Now, in the realm of photosynthesis and cellular respiration, as I told you this before, you need to be familiar with these um, chemical formula, okay? So you need to grasp that photosynthesis involves taking carbon dioxide and water and using energy from the sun to make a sugar molecule, not necessarily glucose, but a sugar molecule, and oxygen. So plants bring in carbon dioxide, plants bring in water, they use energy from the sun to crank off a sugar molecule, and then they release oxygen as a byproduct. This is what they're doing. They're making the sugar, oxygen is released as a byproduct of their metabolism. Whereas you bring in the sugar molecule and oxygen that you breathe in, and you will release you exhale, you release carbon dioxide, water, which is referred to as metabolic water in this particular case, and uh, energy molecules in the form of something like ATP that your cells are capable of using to do the job that they do. So this is how it all fits. These, and again, let me say this, I'm going to be saying the same thing multitudes of times here, folks, so just bear with me. These two chemical formulas are the opposite of one another. Here we got carbon dioxide, water, and energy from the sun, and out comes glucose and oxygen. Here we have glucose and oxygen coming in and releasing carbon dioxide, water, and energy in the form of ATP. Here we're taking a diffuse form of energy like sunlight and turning it into a highly concentrated form of energy like a sugar molecule, and here we're taking a highly concentrated form of energy like a sugar molecule and turning it into a different highly concentrated energy molecule like ATP. That, that is a snapshot into the realm of photosynthesis and cellular respiration. And let me just say this so that we're clear before we even start rolling through this. For our purposes, plants are capable of photosynthesis, but they also can do cellular respiration. They also require ATP. Plants need ATP too, so they have mitochondria and they do cellular respiration. Whereas you do not have chloroplast. All you have is mitochondria which do cellular respiration so you can't photosynthesize you have to bring in this content by consuming it oh shoot 
I was hoping the next slide would explain this, but it's probably a couple down the line. <laughs> well, all right. So before we move any further, man, we have to broach the subject of redox reactions. I find redox reactions more irritating than anything else as a concept, but it's important, and you need to know what I mean when I say redox. So let's talk about it. A redox reaction is a coupled chemical reaction where either a molecule or atoms, one is oxidized and one is reduced simultaneously. It is a redox reaction. Redox. One is reduced, one is oxidized simultaneously when the reaction takes place. Now, what the heck does this mean? Oxidation means you lose electrons. Reduction means you gain electrons, and we'll also use as a surrogate for an electron because it, you know it's hard to grasp this. Free hydrogen atoms. So oxidation means to lose electrons or free hydrogen atoms, or reduction means to gain electrons or free hydrogen atoms. Now let me tell you this the way that I understand it in my own brain, and that is to say that to be reduced means to become reduced in charge. Your charge gets reduced. If you are reduced, you're reduced in charge. And if your charge goes down, I like to think of that as becoming more negative, that is gaining an electron. Remember our uh, chemical reaction with sodium and chlorine to make salt sodium chloride? This is an ionic bond. Sodium chloride is a perfect example of a redox reaction. Here, the sodium atom releases an electron that becomes part of chlorine. In other words, the sodium atom lost an electron, it is oxidized, whereas the chlorine atom gained an electron, it is reduced. It's a redox reaction. One loses the electron, the other gains the electron. And if I'm gaining electrons, my charge goes down, I am reduced in charge. From now on, when you think about this, when you see reduction, you need to think reduced in charge. The charge goes down, which means you're gaining electrons. That is how this works. Photosynthesis and cellular respiration, these are both coupled redox reactions, both of them. Uh, in the event of photosynthesis, carbon dioxide becomes reduced, it gains free hydrogens, gains electrons from water. Water loses electrons and just becomes oxygen. The carbon dioxide gains electrons and becomes glucose. All right. So you see the, uh, the movement of the hydrogen here. The hydrogen comes over to carbon dioxide to become glucose, hydrogen reduction, and the water loses its hydrogens, loss of electrons, hydrogens, to become oxygen. And then cellular respiration is just a mirror image of that. So, cellular respiration, photosynthesis, these are redox reactions. These are redox reactions. All right, chloroplast and photosynthesis. So, chloroplast captures solar energy and use it to convert water and carbon dioxide into carbohydrates. That is an absolute fact. Uh, what do I want to talk about here? Carbon dioxide has been reduced and water is oxidized, we've already said that. Uh, the energy provided by solar radiation, okay, this is all good data. Uh, reduction of carbon dioxide to form glucose stores 686 kilocalories of energy. I think the real reason I'm doing this at this particular time to say that um, when you build the carbohydrate molecules from photosynthesis, this is energy storing, and it stores a lot of energy. In other words, this is a synthesis reaction. You're building something which stores energy. Alternatively, this would be endergonic. It's an endergonic reaction and an energy storage reaction. You're storing energy in this glucose molecule. That energy initially had come from the sun. So it's an energy storing reaction. It is endergonic. Yeah. Yeah. I'm totally down. That's really all I want to say about that. Uh, and then mitochondria by comparison. So mitochondria oxidize carbohydrates and use the released energy to build ATP. The idea is chloroplast make sugars, which are then used by mitochondria to make ATP. All right, that is just how this all goes from the uh, the full breakdown of glucose molecules. Glucose has been oxidized and lost its electron atoms. Yeah. I do have a little bit of a point to be made here, and that is uh, right down here. Mitochondria in your cells oxidize glucose in a step-by-step -step fashion. Uh, the reason I say that this is important is to point out that the way that cellular respiration works is not quick. 
It's a slow, steady, step by step by step by step process. Uh, the concept is that the uh, the more steps along the way, the more simplistic the way that this is done. Use little bits at a time. Uh, the more efficient the system becomes, uh, so that you can more efficiently utilize the energy from a uh, carbohydrate molecule to build ATP. So there are ways in your cells that you can very quickly break down uh, sugar molecules and sequester very little energy from them in reality, or you can very slowly oxidize glucose in a step-by-step -step fashion, and you can release lots of energy from those molecules, but it's in a little bit more complicated format. And you're going to see that when we get into cellular respiration a little bit later on. The real point to these two slides is just to point out that it's a redox reaction, to show you where this uh, stuff's coming from, to say that chloroplasts store energy and that the mitochondria release the energy that is stored there to do other things with, primarily to make ATP. All right, that's good enough for me. Uh, let's see, these forms a cycle. It's a redox cycle. Uh, and cycle is a strong word. Like your, your book uses the term that this is a redox cycle, but it's not exactly cyclic. The reality is that for photosynthesis to function, what we have is sunlight flowing in to the chloroplasts of these plants, uh, which then make carbohydrates, and then those carbohydrates flow into uh, the use of mitochondria or cellular respiration, and then that is then released as heat eventually. So to say this is cyclic is a strong comment. The reality is that sunlight is full, or let me rephrase, energy is flowing in as sunlight and constantly being released as heat. So every metabolic step along the way, uh, way is going to release a little bit of heat, a little bit of heat, a little bit of heat. And what we're really getting at here is the second law of thermodynamics. This is the law of entropy. The idea is that every time energy changes form, a little bit of free energy is released into the environment. That is classic, classic entropy. So uh, again, let me just make sure we're clear on this. While your book says that this is a redox cycle, uh, that's not necessarily the way it really works. The reality is that energy flows in from the sun and it flows back out into the atmosphere as heat. All right, um, autotrophs and heterotrophs is really where we need to be. And I feel like we've already had this conversation, so I'm gonna do it quickly. Uh, in the world around you, there are autotrophs, which are considered primary producers. Uh, these autotrophs will utilize sunlight uh, and photosynthetic activity to build carbohydrate molecules. That is what's happening here. An autotroph is a primary producer. They utilize photosynthesis to convert sunlight into sugars. Taking sunlight and turning that into sugars. That is autotrophs, primary producers as opposed to heterotrophs like yourself, uh, which are secondary producers. You use cellular respiration and mitochondria to take sugar molecules and turn those into ATP. Now, I said this before and I'm gonna say it again. Plants have both chloroplast and mitochondria because plants need ATP too. You only have mitochondria, which means you have to consume secondary production. You have to consume things which are either primary producers or that have also consumed primary producers at some stage in their lives. Perfect. And that takes us here. All right, we're getting to the meat of things now, folks. So um, plants convert solar energy. The reality is that inside of plants, we have these very specialized photosynthetic pigments, specialized photosynthetic pigments. Uh, that are capable of absorbing various spectra of sunlight and then turning that into, in essence, carbohydrates. Uh, now, in the world around us, there's actually a lot of light, or what we call uh, electromagnetic radiation, or radiant energy in the grand scheme, you name it. Very little of this is actually used as visible light, the light that we can see. So there's infrared and UV as examples that you are probably pretty familiar with. Infrared being basically heat and UV radiation coming from the sun that can cause you problems. Um, visible light makes up a very narrow spectrum of what you would think of as the, the light in the world around you, this form of radiation. Now, of the visible light spectrum, uh, not all of it is going to be utilized for photosynthetic activities. 
And what I really want to get at here is the way in which you see leaves in the world around you. Now, if I ask you what leaves look like, you probably would tell me that they're, you know, green and they have veins and they're thin, this kind of thing. The fact that they're green is very telling. Now, <clears throat> there are various different plant pigments that allow photosynthetic activity to take place. There's actually way more than we're going to talk about. We're only going to talk about three. These are the chlorophylls, chlorophyll A and B, okay, chlorophyll A and B, and uh, shown here is kind of an orangey color, the carotenoids. Uh, chlorophyll has a greenish hue to it, so when you see a plant, it's got a very green color. You know there's a lot of chlorophyll to be found there, and when you see these uh, orangey colored leaves, something like this, you know that there's a lot of carotenoids being found there. Now, why, why, why? The idea is as follows. If you look at the absorption spectrum, as from here, invisible light, if you look at the absorption spectrum, chlorophyll absorbs all the light in this area, and then very little in here, and then it absorbs all the light in that area. Chlorophyll is excellent at absorbing purple and blue light, it's excellent at absorbing orange and red light, but chlorophyll is not very good at utilizing green light. So what happens? When light hits chlorophyll, it absorbs most of the energy that's there, but it reflects the green light back out into space. So when you look at a plant, when you look at these green plants, what you're seeing is light, green light, bouncing off of the leaves here and hitting you in the eyes and allowing your eyes to interpret that. When you see a plant and it's green, that means that the plant is reflecting green light and absorbing everything else. So chlorophyll uses every other color but green is the way you need to think about it. Carotenoids, similar but different. Carotenoids do very well at absorbing most of the light on this end of the spectrum. But carotenoids don't do as well at absorbing and utilizing orangey, yellowish, red colors. Okay, So when you look at a plant that's got these kind of crazy orangey colors, uh, what's happening here is the uh, carotenoids that are there are absorbing all the light on that end of the spectrum, and this end of the spectrum gets reflected back out into space. You can see it because the plant can't use it. When you look at a leaf and it has a color, the color you see there is the color that the plant can't utilize. I realize I'm harping on this, but people really struggle with it. The reason a leaf is green is it because... Let me try again. The reason a leaf is green is, it, is because it reflects green light. It doesn't use it. It reflects it away. It gets rid of it by reflecting it because it can't absorb it. Photosynthesis takes place in the green portions of plants, think leaves for our purposes, and in those leaves you've got these outer cuticular linings that kind of keep everything safe, uh, and then the middle portions are referred to as the mesophyll, meso means middle, middle portions, uh, and it is here in the mesophyll that you find the chloroplasts that are capable of conducting photosynthesis. Okay, The chloroplasts are found in the mesophilic tissues. Let's just go ahead and lay on you a little bit of, a, of how the chloroplast is put together. Uh, I'm probably going to talk about this more later, but I'll go ahead and do it now. Inside this chloroplast, you got these little discs. The discs are called the thylakoids, and it's those thylakoids that house chlorophyll and chloroplast. Or let me rephrase. It's the thylakoids that house chlorophyll A and B and carotenoids and all that fun stuff. Okay, so you're going to find in the thylakoid membrane all the pigments that are going to be responsible for photosynthetic activity. So here's our chloroplast. In that chloroplast, the thylakoids are the part that deal with light. Now the thylakoids come in little stacks called grana, and also there's a fluid inside of that chloroplast called the stroma. So when you see stroma, that's the fluid in the chloroplast, and then you see the thylakoids. The thylakoids are the part that house the chlorophyll give the plant the green coloration that you'd expect. All right, photosynthetic requirements are carbon dioxide and water. Uh, the water comes from the ground, okay? So plants have a vascular system that is not unlike your vascular system. They're capable of conveying water up and down their stems when necessary, uh, particularly using special uh, vessel units called xylem and phloem. If you take a 
uh, like a 104 at Shelton, you'll see Xylem and Phloem all over the place. Uh, it were references therein. And then, of course, there's the gas, carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is taken into the plant via the leaves. So water comes from the roots, uh, and then the carbon dioxide comes from the leaves. The leaves have tiny little openings on them called the stomata, or stomates. Singular would be stomate. Stomata is plural. And these stomata are capable of opening and closing. We'll talk about this in lab. But they're capable of opening and closing. And when they open, they allow gas exchange. And when they close, they prevent gas exchange. This is not a whole lot different from your mouth and your lungs. Okay, you open your mouth and you breathe in. And you release air and you can close your mouth when necessary. That is not unlike the way that the stomates on a plant works. So these are very complicated organisms. They're neat in the way that they function. They will open their stomates to allow gas exchange. They close their stomates to prevent gas exchange. And uh, in essence, water loss, basically. When the plant's dry, it closes its stomate so it can't lose water. Uh, and then it is capable of pulling fluids into the system via its roots. So you'll see people like take a spray bottle and spray office plants on the leaves. They're wasting their time. That does nothing for the plant. you got to get it to the roots. All right, this slide in the next several slides, I'm going to be going very stepwise to try to gently coax you into the concept of how the two steps of photosynthesis really work. Okay, uh, I'm going to try to take my sweet time. We're, we're going to see how this pans out. But generally speaking, photosynthesis is broken down into two steps. These are referred to as the light reaction and the dark reaction or what I will also call the light-dependent reaction and the light-independent reaction. And we're going to throw other terms at this too, but, but I'm just trying to get you allocated set up as to how this is going to function. So the light-dependent reaction is described here in very simple format, and then the light-independent reaction is described here in very simple format. The way it goes is as follows. The light-dependent reaction takes place in the thylakoid membranes where you find chlorophyll. Right? The chlorophyll, all right, all right, all right. The chlorophyll is in the thylakoid membranes. And what's going to happen is sunlight's going to come in, it's going to hit the chlorophyll, it's going to energize some electrons, and those energized electrons are used in the light dependent reaction to make two molecules, NADPH and ATP. Period. The end. These are both just high energy molecules. Sunlight's coming in, it's light dependent. Sunlight's coming in, it's hitting your chlorophyll, or a plant's chlorophyll, I should say, and making NADPH and ATP. These two will then be used to power the light independent reaction. The energy from here is used to run this. And what this does is it takes carbon dioxide and fixes it to make a carbohydrate. Okay? The end result of photosynthesis is to make a carbohydrate. And this is done out in the stroma of the chloroplast. This is done, light dependent reaction is done in the thylakoid membranes. The light independent reactions, those are done in the stroma. And again, the idea is this. The product of the light dependent reaction is to make ATP and NADPH. The product of the light independent reaction is to make a carbohydrate. And the next multitude of slides all go back and forth just sort of describing this simple process, so pay attention. All right, the process photosynthesis light dependent reaction takes place only in the presence of light. These are energy capturing endergonic storage uh, reactions. What's gonna happen here is sunlight comes in, it hits the thylakoid membranes, and electrons become energized. And those energized electrons are used to do various things by the chloroplast to end up making ATP and NADPH. It's a little complicated, uh, but they end up making ATP and NADPH. Now, the ATP and NADPH from the light-dependent reaction gets plugged into the light-independent reaction, also referred to as the Calvin cycle. It is named after this guy, Melvin Calvin, uh, that used uh, isotope ratios to figure out how the hell all this worked. So if you're sitting here looking at this thinking, how is it possible that we know this guy figured it out. Uh, so the Calvin cycle, the light independent reaction, happens out here in the stroma. And what's going to happen is the NADPH and ATP from the light dependent reaction 
comes into this and it's going to be used to make a carbohydrate. Nothing fancy. There's nothing fancy happening here. Here, light dependent reaction, light comes in, you make NADPH and ATP out of it. Here, you take the NADPH and ATP and you make a sugar. That's it. In a nutshell, that is photosynthesis. You have a light dependent reaction where you make two high energy molecules that are plugged into the light independent reaction where you make a sugar. Simple. Very simple. Now let's complicate things just a little bit. <laughs> now that you know the basics, let's complicate things a little bit. So the light reactions, uh, let's see, what do I want to say here? We should probably just talk about the photosystems. I cut a lot of this stuff out because I didn't find it to be that pertinent. Uh, I need to talk to you about these photosystems here. These are so important. What we're looking at is a thylakoid membrane. And on that thylakoid membrane, you find all kinds of things internally. It looks just like a cell membrane. But key amongst these are these photosystems. The photosystem, as I say here, is a pigment complex that collects solar energy like an antenna. The idea here is that these excite electrons, and those excited electrons get dumped into what are referred to as electron transport chains, where the energy is kind of used in a stepwise fashion to power photosynthesis. Okay, so light comes in, energizes electrons in these photosystems. That high energy electron is going to get dumped over into their associated electron transport chains, and that's going to be, kind of lead to the formation of the ATP and NADPH that we talked about previously. So I just wanted to get out of the way that these capture solar energy. They are in the thylakoid membrane. These are going to contain your chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, whatever. Let's go through and talk about the light reaction in detail. And boy, it's, it's tough for folks to get their brains wrapped around this. So you, you may want to rewind and go back through it a few times just to sort of see if you can figure it out in your own mind. I'm just going to lay it on you as, as best I can, and we're going to see what happens. Now, the way that we align this is by first looking at the parts. There is a photosystem 2. I know how weird it sounds, but the first one we talk about is photosystem 2. That is going to be followed by an electron transport chain. Next is a photosystem 1, followed by another electron transport chain. And then next to this is a special molecule called ATP synthase. This is an enzyme. ATP synthase. It is an enzyme that makes ATP. Nothing fancy. So we've got photosystem 2, a pigment complex that collects solar radiation followed by an electron transport chain that is basically a hydrogen pump. Nothing fancy. All this is going to do is pump hydrogen into the thylakoid. Next to this is photosystem 1, which energizes electrons and then sends those electrons into its adjacent electron transport chain. And this electron transport chain is responsible for making NADPH, which is one of the products of the light reaction. So let's go through and discuss it. Now, in the formula for photosynthesis, you know that coming in is carbon dioxide and water. Well, the water that comes in for a plant is going to be used by this photosystem too. The water gets broken up, so the hydrogen leaves, the oxygen is vented to the atmosphere after this. Uh, this is where the oxygen comes from that plants release, that we utilize. But some of the electrons from this are going to be taken by photosystem 2. Electrons from the splitting of water are taken by photosystem 2 and energized. They're taken from a low energy state and put into a high energy state using sunlight. Photosystem 2 uses sunlight to energize electrons which are then dumped into its adjacent electron transport chain. The high energy electrons that are dumped in this adjacent electron transport chain simply pump hydrogen into the thylakoid. Nothing fancy. We're just packing the thylakoid with hydrogen. Some of it comes off the water, some of it comes from the first electron transport chain. Next, the electrons from here that are now at a low energy state are moved into photosystem 1. Uh, photosystem 1 re-energizes those electrons and dumps them to the adjacent electron transport chain and those high energy electrons are used to make NADPH. Boom. Right there. So, what are we doing here? We're taking sunlight and energizing electrons. 
Some of those energized electrons are dumped into here to pump hydrogen into the thylakoid. We're going to fill that thylakoid with hydrogen like a balloon, man. It's going to be packed with hydrogen. And then the electrons are re-energized in photosystem 1 and used to make NADPH. What we have at this stage is a thylakoid full of hydrogen. That hydrogen leaves through the ATP synthase molecule through a process that we call chemiosmosis. You can see that here, chemiosmosis. Uh, we're, we're packing a chemical into density and it's leaving from low, uh, high concentration to low concentration. Let's think of this as osmotic. And as it leaves, as hydrogen leaves through ATP and synthase, it causes ATP to get made. Remember, what comes into the light reaction? Water comes into it, that gets broken up, and some of the hydrogen stays in the thylakoid, some of the electrons move into the electron transport chain. Uh, what else comes into the light reaction? Well, light does. Okay, The light is going to be used in photosystem 2 and photosystem 1. All they do is energize electrons. There's nothing fancy here. And then once they take their energized electrons and dump them into the electron transport chains, one of them pumps hydrogen in, the other makes NADPH. Now we've got NADPH that's made, and we've got a hydrogen-filled thylakoid. That hydrogen leaves through ATP synthase, makes ATP. Just the process, the kinetic energy of it leaving through ATP synthase causes the production of ATP. And really, man, that's, that's about all I want to say about this. So the light-dependent reaction is dependent upon light. Light comes in, it's hitting this first photosystem, we call this photosystem 2, energizes electrons that are used to pump hydrogen into the thylakoid via the electron transport chain. The low energy electrons from here are moved over to the next photosystem, we call it photosystem 1, where they're re-energized and used to make any DPH. Now we've got a thylakoid full of hydrogen, that the hydrogen leaves via ATP synthase, makes ATP. That is the light dependent reaction in a nutshell. Remember, what comes out of the light dependent reaction? NADPH and ATP. There's the NADPH being made. Here's the ATP being made. And that's how this works. It's really not that complicated. All of this, all of this wording, it describes the process I just told you. But the general idea is photosystem 2 energizes electrons which move into the electron transport chain to pump hydrogen. Photosystem 1 gets these electrons, re-energizes them. They're used to make NADPH. The hydrogen pump into the thylakoid leads via ATP synthase, and that makes ATP. Just the, it's like a motor. As it spins, it makes ATP. And it spins because hydrogen atoms are constantly flowing through. That's it, man. That is it. That is the light reaction in its most simplistic fashion. Yeah. And that takes us to the dark reaction, or uh, the Calvin cycle in the grand scheme of things. So what's going to happen in the Calvin cycle is very simple. Uh, we're going to have three steps, and this is part of what we call C3 photosynthesis. This can be done in slightly different ways, uh, using different types of plants that use different photosynthetic pathways. Uh, but your average plant that you're familiar with conducts C3 photosynthesis, so that's the way we're going to sort of talk about this. And in this, there are three stages to the Calvin cycle. These three stages taking place in the stroma, the dark reaction, they don't require light. They use the ATP and NADPH that we just described coming from the light reaction. This is broken down into three steps. Fixation of carbon dioxide, reduction of carbon dioxide, and then the rebuilding of a special molecule called RUBP, ribulose bisphosphate. Okay, you don't have to tell me about that, you can just call it RUBP. So how does it work? Now we're going to again make this very simple. The first step is this called carbon dioxide fixation. The carbon dioxide that the plant uses is fixed into a sugar molecule. A simple, simple sugar molecule. A carbohydrate. That is then reduced. Now what does that mean? Right? Reduced in charge. It's going to gain electrons. Uh, it is reduced to form, or let me rephrase, let me put this to you in a slightly different format, it's reduced by the energy from NADPH and ATP. Okay, the ATP and NADPH coming from the light reaction reduce carbon dioxide to form a very special molecule that you need to become friends with called G3P. G3P. It's the only one I'm going to ask you to know. G3P is special. 
you need to realize that carbon dioxide coming in to the Calvin cycle, the dark reaction, is going to be fixed into a carbohydrate. Then it's going to be modified. It's going to be reduced by ATP and NADPH to form G3P. And then at the end of the day, the third step of the Calvin cycle is to regenerate the original molecule that begins carbon fixation, called RUVP. you got to make it ready to do the process again. I think that's good enough. So carbon dioxide's coming in to be fixed into a carbohydrate molecule. That carbohydrate molecule is reduced by ATP and NADPH to form G3P. That leaves the system, and then you have to rebuild what's called RUBP, ribose bisphosphate, uh, so the cycle can continue. Again, this is a cycle. It's spinning constantly, constantly spinning. We're taking carbon dioxide and fixing it. We're reducing it using ATP and NADPH from the light reaction, and then rebuilding the RUBP, the molecule necessary to start the cycle again. Now, why are we trying to do this? Why are we making it? Okay, the whole process, the light reaction making ATP and NADPH, the dark reaction, the resulting molecule is G3P. At the end of the day, this whole photosynthetic process has been to make G3P. And the reason we're making G3P is because it's a progenitor carbohydrate that can be used by the plant to make anything. All right, like anything that plant needs, it's made from G3P. Fatty acids and glycerols that make up plant oils like canola oil, olive oil, all that fun stuff, it's made initially using G3P. Uh, simple sugars come from G3P. Fructose, for example, glucose, sucrose, all from G3P. Starch and cellulose, so starch in a potato used in an energy storage molecule comes from G3P. Cellulose in plant cell walls that give them strength, the fiber, comes from G3P. G3P is used to make amino acids in some cases when the plant needs specific amino acids. G3P gives rise to everything. Okay? Everything be it glucose, or cellulose, or fats and oils, or, uh, you know, protein-based molecules, it's all initially coming from G3P. G3P is the family molecule that makes everything else. So the whole photosynthetic process, light reaction, dark reaction, is to make G3P. The whole idea is to make G3P. Because G3P can be used to make everything the plant needs. So I guess that is to say thank you plants. All right? Food, water, oxygen, building materials. Uh, a lot of places using plant materials for heating and cooling. All of it. The energy we use on a daily basis both to power this computer and for you to be able to understand what I'm saying. All of it. All of it comes from plants and their photosynthetic capacities. That's how this works. Now let's talk about the other forms of photosynthesis real quick. Uh, there are a few that are worthy of our consideration. What we've been talking about up to this stage are C3 plants. C C3 plants internally look like this. And the idea is here that everything is kind of together. Okay, because everything is kind of together, if this plant were to get dry, all right, if it gets pretty dry, what will end up happening is uh, the oxygen that is kind of built up in the tissues from the breakdown of water molecules. So when you break up H2O, you release a lot of oxygen. That oxygen begins to bind in with RUBP from the dark reaction, and it just causes all kinds of hell from the plant. It's called photorespiration, and it makes the plant not function very well. It's a very inefficient way of doing what the plant needs to do. Photorespiration is bad. Uh, so ideally, the plant would have a way to prevent photorespiration. And that's what C4 plants do. C4 plants are like the grasses in the field, or corn is the classic C4 plant. Like if you look at a leaf on a, a corn plant, or if you go and pull a, a piece of grass out from your yard, you look at it, it looks a little different from like an oak tree leaf, for example, because it's a C4 plant. It's specialized to be in very much drier climates. Really there for drier climates. Uh, so in these drier climates to prevent photorespiration, which is a problem for plants, they sort of partition off 
uh, the Venus system and all that fun stuff from where photosynthesis takes place. Okay, and by partitioning things apart, it basically allows them to prevent photorespiration. And uh, really, that's that's all I want to say about this. So C3 plants are really great for uh, sort of middle climate areas, kind of cooler, lots of water, whereas C4 plants are kind of set up for a little more arid environments. Not a desert by any stretch of the imagination, but think about, again, the grass in your yard. It's very exposed. It gets a lot of heat. doesn't get as much water. And uh, so it has to have a little bit of a tweak on how photosynthesis takes place by partitioning out where things are found. It's not all together. Everything is in a little bit different place uh, to allow it to function for photosynthesis. And then, of course, there is a crustulation acid metabolism, or, or can plants. Uh, can plants are hardcore desert dwellers, okay? And the way that they're capable of preventing photorespiration isn't by arranging the leaf differently. What they'll do is they'll do um, the light reaction during the day, and then at night they do the dark reaction, basically. So what they'll do is they'll seal their stomata off during the day to prevent heat loss, or I'm sorry, to prevent water loss, and then at night they'll open their stomata to exchange gases when it's cool in the desert. Okay. Um, I think that's really all I need to say. So during the night, can plants fix carbon dioxide? They allow carbon dioxide in. Yeah, that's fine. And then during the day, uh, they make NADPH and ATP uh, by the light reaction. Yeah, so they, they have a day-night partitioning. They do the light reaction during the day and the dark reaction during the night, which is kind of cool. Adaptations to different environments. So C3 plants are better for cooler temperatures and lots of moisture. Like, think about the good old soft, herbaceous flowering plants. Those are classic C3 plants. C4 plants are a little harsher. Uh, they are adapted for higher light intensities and greater temperatures with more limited rainfall. Again, like corn or grasses here, these are classic C4 plants. You can look at the structure of the leaf and tell that it's just very different. And then by comparison, there are can plants. Like if you go to Lowe's and you look at the succulents, the hardcore desert plants, like here, this is a blue agave that you make tequila from. Uh, these are going to be can plants. They have these big, thick, fleshy leaves. And what they're going to do is they're going to be active doing the light reaction during the day. And then they open their stomata at night and do the uh, Calvin cycle. Yeah, it's perfect. And really, that's that's all I want to say. The rest of this is pretty neat. Uh, but it's, it's more like if we have a lot of time at the end of class, uh, it's kind of a neat thing to talk about that your book just throws in randomly. Because your book freaking loves to throw in random things. So, yeah, that, that's got it. So, the conversation with C3, C4, and can plants, that is the end of the story. So, what you really need to get from this lecture is you need to be able to walk me through Photosystem 2 to the electron transport chain, to Photosystem 1 and its electron transport chain. Understand where the NADPH comes from. Understand where the ATP comes from. Understand that this is the thylakoid membrane. Take me from the NADPH and ATP made in the light reaction into the Calvin cycle. And explain to me how these are used to reduce this carbon dioxide based carbohydrate molecule to form G3P. Tell me why G3P is important, being that it gives rise to all these other parts of the plant and general plant function. And uh, that more or less has got it, folks. That's, that's what we need to do. So that's photosynthesis in a nutshell. Uh, I hope that it was beneficial for you. I hope you understood. I know it's complicated. You might have to watch this a few times and ask some questions. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to post them in the comments and I'll respond. And uh, I suppose that's it. So be expecting a quiz on this at some point in the relatively near future. And I'll be getting your respiration chapter out to you as well. All right. Thanks, guys.